What's going on guys? Lester here, full-time Amazon seller. In this video podcast, we have Chris Potter today. Chris is one of the co-founders of Tall Oak Advisors. Tall Oak Advisors is the expert when it comes to e-commerce, tax, bookkeeping, and financial services. Chris is also full of knowledge when it comes to e-commerce in general. He's had over 15 years of experience starting from eBay all the way to Amazon, so he has experience with all of them and pretty much can answer any questions related to that. And that's why in this video, we kind of dig deep in terms of what it's like in the early stages as an Amazon seller, things what you need to start doing, whether that's bookkeeping, separating your business cards and finances, when it makes sense to have an LLC, go into an S Corp and other uh, tax write-offs that are beneficial in terms of the Amazon business in general. Hope you guys enjoy this. Any question? You could reach out to him in Twitter directly. He's pretty active there at Chris Potter361. Again, it's Chris Potter361 at Twitter. And any other questions, feel free to comment down below. And I hope you guys enjoy. All right, we are live here with Chris. How are you, Chris? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well, well. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm really excited today because a lot of the things that or a lot of the questions I sent you were kind of tax related finance questions, which you are um really tweet a lot about and, and twitter so i'm really excited to go over it and uh, if you kind of just want to introduce yourself like how you started and your business right now so that way you know mostly like new amazon sellers are familiar um, who you are yeah definitely so i actually started selling on amazon and ebay back in 2005 and i did that part-time for about three years and i went full-time in 2008 and i sold on amazon from 2008 till 2020 so pretty much about 15 years in the e-commerce industry. And then in 2020, I actually exited my e-commerce businesses and I bought tax offices. And so now we have 47 tax offices across Virginia and North Carolina. Wow. And uh, in 2022, we actually started doing uh, bookkeeping and uh, CFO work for e-commerce businesses. And we also do tax work for e-commerce businesses as well. So that's kind of the, the background in, the, in my e-commerce industry experience i did pretty much every business model imaginable did retail arbitrage online arbitrage wholesale private label drop shipping also ran my own website at one point and over those years i've also done various other entrepreneurial projects like owning real estate and uh you know doing i did a paid paid community for amazon sellers at one point there was quite a few different things i did over the years but that's kind of it i had a blog design website i bought and resold to at one point so even though I don't want to do blogs on it. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much right now, there's so much opportunities out there that it's so easy to get distracted. But uh, I think it's also important to, kind of, you know, especially for new Amazon sellers to kind of focus on that, especially in their first year, you know, because um, this is kind of like my year, uh, first full year. I started late mm -hmm. in 2021. So I had full 2022 where I'd quit my full-time job and really wanted to dial into Amazon and see how, you know, what can I do with it, how far I can go. And in terms of that first year being a new Amazon seller, I had so many questions aside from just growth, you know, like at the back of my head, it's like, all right, I'm going to have to pay taxes. How am I going to keep track of all this stuff? So a lot of these things were coming up. How, what would you say in terms of like a first first time new Amazon seller to focus on during their, you know, their first step into the uh, e-commerce business. I mean, honestly, when you're first starting out, the biggest thing is just to figure the systems out and figure out how to be profitable. That's, that's the number one step. And so that's why you see a lot of people learning how to do sourcing in the Amazon world or doing sourcing is probably the number one thing. That's the most important thing to do. And realistically bookkeeping. Yes. You should keep track of, everything you're doing but doing a sort of like high scale like even paying for me to do bookkeeping generally for a lot of people in the first year sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense just because of the fact that you're trying to continuously reinvest all of your profits that first year and you're trying to get better at sourcing in a lot of, in a lot of cases like your first you know few months might not be profitable you can't take money out of business that sort of thing so trying to justify paying someone you know a decent amount of money every single month to do bookkeeping doesn't necessarily make sense. So typically what I recommend for most new sellers is just to try, when you first start out, figure out how to do sourcing and just keep track of everything that you're doing. Usually inventory lab is probably a, a decent spot to start out with once you've made a little bit of profit. 
Now, some people typically start with Excel. They just keep every transaction they do in Excel, and they kind of graduate to Inventory Lab. And Inventory Lab does an okay job. It's not an accounting software, but it's good enough to give you management uh, style of decision making that you can make based off of reporting you get from Inventory Lab. Plus, it's help you with listing too. But that's kind of the, the main one I would start off with. And just make sure you enter in all of your buy costs. Make sure you enter in all of your expenses into Inventory Lab. And when it comes around to taxes. We, we typically can handle people with their taxes if they've already done that. And so in your first year, that would be my recommendation is to stick with that. Once you get to about forty, fifty thousand dollars per month, that's when we start talking about, uh, you know, let's put you into an actual bookkeeping solution uh, in QuickBooks or Zero and so forth. And obviously, if you have some sort of accounting background, you can start using that piece of software ahead of time. But if you have no accounting background at all and you don't really want to spend your time learning how to do accounting, which most don't, because it takes a yeah. lot of time to learn it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, if, spend your time learning sourcing. Use Inventory Lab, and you're usually pretty good that first year. Okay. Awesome. And in terms of, you know, bookkeeping. Yeah, I agree. There's so many things you can, you know, have to t- keep track of, like for online arbitrage, maybe it's a lot easier because you're ordering stuff it's in your email, right? You can do a quick search, but if you're doing a combination of retail arbitrage, you know, you go to different stores, all of a sudden these receipts can be just like everywhere. And if, you know, something does happen to your health account and you need to provide, you know, Amazon, like a proof of receipt and all that stuff, you're going to be running around. So, yeah, bookkeeping in the first year where you're just, you know, learning how to walk, basically, um, regarding Amazon e-commerce is uh, really important. So let's say after their first year, right, or they're, you know, they're getting their feet, um, they're, they're starting to walk in terms of Amazon. Someone that doesn't have an LLC, because that's how I started. I had a per- I just did it with my personal because I started a side hustle. Then I was like, all right, I'm taking this seriously. I'm quitting my job. Now it's time for me to get an LLC. Then after that, you know, we had a talk about two months ago of how I can convert that LLC to an S corp. Do you mind just talking about like the different stages and when it makes sense to kind of you know transition from LLC to S corp? Yeah, certainly. So the you know when you're looking at it from an accounting perspective, there is no difference between a sole proprietor and an LLC. There's no difference at all. It's tax exactly the same. The difference is is a legal aspect where when you, you're a limited liability company, you do get some legal protections if you were to ever get sued or run into those sorts of things. So that's kind of that's kind of the reason why that we usually recommend to start out with an LLC. But the, the biggest the biggest thing you have to keep in mind, especially when you're first starting, is do whatever you possibly can to separate out your expenses for personal versus business. What we see what we see in some cases is they start out as a, as a sole proprietor and they're like, I'm just going to try this out. Um, and see if it works. Yeah, so just buy yeah exactly. Credit on their personal credit cards, and then yeah. like on the same credit card, now they have all their personal expenses too, and their business expenses. So basically, as soon as you possibly can, even if you're not going to start a new LLC, immediately open up a second checking account, and then take one. Your let's say you already have you know two or three credit cards. Just mm-hmm. take one credit card and use that only for personal, and then your other ones use those only for business. Even if they are personal cards, just separating the the, the transactions out is by far the number one recommendation for that. And then, you know, at some point switch over to an LLC. If you don't do it right away, do it as soon as you can. And realistically, if you're starting out on Amazon, I would recommend that if you're going to actually do Amazon for real, yeah. start out with an LLC right away. Because if you okay. start with a sole proprietor and then switch to an LLC later on, now you have to go through a process of changing your bank account in the EIN, typically on Amazon, which is some case suspends your account for a day or two. And yeah. you don't want to deal with that. So uh, just get wow. taken care of right away. Yeah. So having, now a for, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Having an account is no fun. I mean, having the account to spend is no fun. I've heard, you know, crazy stories. And I think you experienced that at one point too, right? <laughs> one point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely more than one point for suspensions. My first suspension, yeah. you know, I think 2017. So uh, yeah. I've dealt with suspensions many times. Uh, wow. Anyways. So back to the back to the LLC S corp conversation. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you were asking about you know when you actually move to an S corp, what it does, those sorts of things. So I'm going to try and recap this in a very short amount of time as possible because I probably talk about this for an hour. But, uh, <laughs> so the key full, thing you're you're full, uh, full of knowledge. That's why yeah. you know, you're here sharing your information. Yeah. So the the key thing is is switching over to an S corp is one way to save on your taxes. And the way it does that is it eliminates your self-employment taxes that you typically have to pay 
uh, than LLC or sole proprietor, which is you know, somewhere between 13, 15%. And you end up saving money on that. Now you do end up starting to take a salary when, when you're an S corp. So you do have to, you do have to pay uh, some taxes as part of that because you're technically an employee at that point. But overall, as long as you're making about $50,000 in taxable income from your business, in general, you're going to end up making more money than, uh, than having to pay out in fees and that sort of thing. So realistically, when we see people hit around $50,000 a year in profit is when we recommend switching over to an S Corp. And just, just to understand the way that that works is it doesn't necessarily change how your business operates. Your bank account's the same, EIN number's the same, you're still technically an LLC. We're just filing with the IRS that you're being taxed differently. That's the only difference. So uh, outside of that, it's just a matter of some different filings you have to do and you have to start taking yourself a salary. But other than that, your, your business functions exactly the same. There's no changes, no worries about Amazon, that sort of thing. So if you start getting to about a $50,000 mark in, in profitability, uh, then we can think about uh, converting you at that point. We can have a discussion about that. Okay. And from my understanding, the way you save tax is, you know, when you're paying yourself, that's how you're getting taxed on instead of the whole business. Is that correct? Kind of. Yeah. Like I mentioned with that self-employment tax, when you move over to an S corp, there is no self-employment tax. And what the self-employment tax is designed to do is it's designed to replace your social care and Medicare that you typically would have as an employee. So what happens is that when you move over to an S corp, there's no self-employment taxes, but then whatever that salary is that you make, you're getting taxed social security and Medicare on that. But then any it. money you make above that salary is not taxed on Social Security, Medicare, or self-employment taxes. And so that's where you end up saving the money. So for example, if you had a $100,000 a year profit and you took a salary for let's say 40 or $50,000 and that, yeah. you know, then that 60 or $50,000 that you have on top of that is not taxed at that 15% rate or 13, I think it's like 13.2, 15%, somewhere out there um, so is kind of where that number is. So that's where the, the biggest saving really comes into. Exactly. Yep. Then in, in terms of write-off, you know, what, does that apply after like all the all those stuff? But clarify that question for me. What, what do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. So, for example, when it comes to, to tax season, right? Mm -hmm. as, a, as a business owner in Amazon, you have, you know, your inventory and, you know, expenses and all that stuff. Yep. Does that get written up after like, you know, like what you submit or before? So with, with an S Corp, what happens is, is that all the money that you pay yourself is then considered a payroll expense. Uh, Got it. Okay. Payroll expense. But because now you're getting a W-2, now you have those wages on the other side. So it's not like the entire amount is a, is a write-off. Because keep in mind that an S Corp still functions just like an LLC where it's technically a pass-through entity. So all of the money that you make, you're still taxed on. Whereas if you move over to a C Corp, that's when you get double tax and you have different things. But uh, but yeah, typically you would have all of your write-offs that would then tell you how much your total profit is. And obviously you'd have your salary, which would technically be a write-off. But again, you're now getting a W-2 as if you work for a company and that would be considered taxable income. So if, if your question is, is that a write-off? Kind of it is, but you're still getting yeah. a W-2 because you're still you know getting that money that comes in. Got it. Okay. Can answer your question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, since we're in the subject of write-off, what are some of the, you know, basic misconceptions that a lot of sellers get wrong in terms of what's considered written off, and what are like you know legitimate stuff they can actually you know write off without having to worry if it, it's legal or not? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I you know I, I do a lot of uh, tweets on Twitter about various. Yeah. Things. And this specific week, I actually prepared uh, every single day this week. I actually uh, did a tweet where we do three things you can write off and one thing you cannot write off. So uh, I'll cover a few things I've talked about in those various tweets. But this entire week, I'm actually doing that. And this is the week of, uh, I think they're recording this on the 18th of January. I'm not sure when this will go live. But during this week, probably by the time you actually listen to this or view this episode, probably most of those tweets will be up. And so, you know, some of the common things that you definitely can write off would be obviously your, your inventory is, is a big one, depending on what type of uh, accounting method you have. So if you have a cash method, you write off your inventory the moment you buy it. If you do accrual, then it's only written off when you actually sell it. And depending on what basis you go on depends. Yeah, definitely talk with your tax professional as far as figuring out what the best method is for you. We personally okay. recommend a, a cruel method for various reasons, but in some scenarios, it does make sense to do cash. So definitely talk with your tax professional about what makes sense to do that. 
But some of that write-offs are for sure that you can write off, like your, your virtual assistant expenses. Anytime you buy a leads list, if you're doing on online arbitrage, if you buy, let's say, uh, shipping supplies to ship things out, though that's deductible. You've got, uh, you know, your cell phone is deductible up to your business percentage usage. So if you use your cell phone for 60% business, then you can write off 60% of your cell phone bill. Uh, you know, other things you can write off that are there for sure write offs would be all of your Amazon expenses. So anything related to Amazon, uh, if you do any sort of like coaching services to learn how to mm -hmm. sell on Amazon, that would be another one. If you buy a course, that's, that's able to be written off as well. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yep, that's a good one. If you have, let's say a storage facility, you can write that off. If for example, you're working out of your house and you do not have a separate place of business, you can actually write off a portion of your house or home, depending if you're renting or if you're in an apartment, that sort of thing. You can write off a portion of uh, your expenses uh, based on your usage of your house. So if, you're, if you have, let's say, 30% of your house is being used for business, then you can write off 30% of all of your expenses related to uh, your house, which would be like rent, utilities, that sort of thing. So you do get that write off as well. So those are a lot of ones that you can def you definitely can do. Uh, one that a lot of people, one thing that people think you can do, but you can't anymore, is actually entertainment expenses. Is actually really, like, like taking someone out for dinner and, and, and stuff like that? So th there's a difference between meals and entertainment. So meals, yes. I see, okay. Okay, meals got it. Is a legitimate business expense. You have documentation showing that you went out with someone. Then yes, that is deductible. What's not okay. deductible is, let's say, going to a, a New York Yankees game or something like that, or going to a club and then buying wine service for everyone. Uh, that's not technically deductible because it's considered en entertainment. So there's kind of a fine line in some of those cases between meals and entertainment because, you know, if it's primarily an entertainment venue, then it's not deductible. And this was actually a change that came in the, the Job Tax Cut, Jobs and Tax Cut Act of 2017. So wow. prior to 2017, you could write a lot of stuff off, but now, you know, as of the last, you know, that, that became uh, effective in 2018. So now the last five years, you've not been able to uh, do entertainment, even though a lot of people think so. Now, I'm referring to this as people who are typically in the e-commerce industry. Now, yeah, if you're okay. like in the entertainment industry, it's entirely possible that some of those expenses could be written off. But specifically, when we're talking about e-commerce businesses, there's no legitimate reason to be able to write off entertainment. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to, I was planning to do some whining and dining with some distributors and wholesalers out there, you know, get a better pricing. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're picking them up for lunch <laughs> or dinner, that's perfectly fine. Uh, okay. You know, one other thing too, if you, that they're talking about like, you know, potentially, you know, hooking up or giving gifts, that sort of thing to, to yeah. the suppliers. One other yeah. thing people may not know as well is that if you give a gift to an individual, you're only actually able to write off $25 per year. That's it. So wow. If you, yep. So if you give them like a if you give them like a, a hundred and fifty dollar gift basket for some reason, you yeah. technically only write off twenty five dollars of that hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. Yep, a lot of people is, don't. Is that like overall for the year or per company you do it? Per person per year. Got it. Okay. Yep. How about cars and automobiles? What, what's the what's the deal with that? Because I've heard people that, you know, some things you can write off. Like, for example, you know, we talk about the $6,000 rule um, write off. Then there's mileage, of course. Which one would make sense? And I guess in terms of tax benefit, like, you know, you would recommend. Yeah. So there's there's two different ways to handle vehicle expenses. One of them is the actual method. And then one of them is the mileage method. You can't basically combine the two. So that means that you can't like write off your gas and also take mileage. You, can, you have to do one or the other. So the actual expenses, what you typically get as part of that is you're writing off all of your gas. You're writing off uh, any repairs you have to do, uh, any maintenance. maintenance you have to do. All that's written off at the actual cost. And then plus you also get a depreciation benefit. And the basic uh, fancy way of saying what depreciation is, is just an additional write off to account for the loss and value of your vehicle over time. Now, there's if you, if you watch a lot of TikTok videos, people talk about the 179 deduction. You probably heard yeah. that where yeah. you basically take your entire vehicle and write it off the first year you buy it. If you don't take a 179 deduction, then typically it's just spread out over multiple years. So that specific deduction just allows you to take it all in that first year. And so 
If you do that, there are some things you have to take into account is now you do have to write off all of your actual expenses. And if you're using a, a part of it for personal use, you're only supposed to do a percentage of what, what your actual business use is. And so there's a lot of cases where, you know, you have these TikTok people saying, oh, yeah, I wrote off my G-Wagon $100,000 and now I get to drive it everywhere. Well, yeah, what they're not telling you is that you're not you're not allowed to write off your personal drive, drive, driving of it. And so these people are probably writing it off and then not actually you know, keeping track that they're actually using it for, for personal purchase, you know, use, usage, which you should be able, you should keep that. And if you're using, if you're using that vehicle for anything more than 50% of uh, business use, if you're doing it for less than 50% business use, you can't use the 179 deduction at all anyway. So that's one of those type of things where they, they don't really tell you everything in those videos. And, and not to mention Agreed. when you take the mileage in most use, in most use cases, mileage is most of the time actually better write off than doing the actual, than the, doing the actual dollars. Unless, unless you have a legitimate reason to take the 179 deduction, then it might make sense. But over time, realistically, your mileage tends to give you more of a benefit than, uh, than taking usage of that. Again, talk to your tax professional because there are cases where 179 deduction legitimately makes sense. Makes sense. But, yeah. But, you know, let's say, for example, your profit for the year is, you know, thirty thousand dollars, and you're like, "Hey, should I be able to write off this hundred thousand dollar G wagon?" It's like <laughs> that potentially cause a red flag for you, but then yeah. actually get audited. And now, you know, let's say for example, you're one of those people who don't actually keep track of where they're driving, and if you were to get audited and you don't keep track of that mileage and showing where you're going, then they might disallow that entire deduction because you didn't actually keep track of what you're doing. And the reality is that most people don't use their, especially in the e-commerce industry. There's Tracking. no business use for you to drive your a vehicle, you know, 12,000 miles a year unless you're doing retail arbitrage. That's the only reason to do it. If you're in any other business model, like there's no real reason to fully write off a vehicle unless you're just doing it to try and get write offs that you probably don't necessarily deserve. Or you're going to buy a vehicle that sits in the business and never gets driven, which is another possibility. But why would you do that? There's no practical yeah. use case. Yeah, it's crazy how like the mileage it's, you know, when I started, right, like I was doing my prepping, shipping. So I was going a lot of trips to UPS. And it's one of those things that you kind of look back. It's like, you know, I wish I had tracked those stuff, but I'm sure you can, I guess, look back to your receipts and maybe input some of those in inventory labs or QuickBooks and stuff. Yeah, in one of those cases, you know, if you're if you're not good at tracking it, get like an app like My IQ is a very good app My to like you. use for that. And if, if you need to reconstruct what you did drive, you potentially can do that based on the mileage. And, and keep in mind that for 2022, if you're going to do this, make sure you have the dates aligned properly because there was an actual mileage change halfway through the year last year. Uh, so if you're going to write it off, the first half of the year was one was one certain amount and the second half of the year is second amount. I think it's about a three or four cent difference and then per mile. And then this year in 2023, I believe it's 62 <clears throat> five cents or somewhere around there is what you get per mile, which adds up extremely quickly. Yeah, it does. Especially again, retail arbitrage and all that stuff. Uh, so Chris, with your company, you know, tall Lock advisors here, you guys, you know, had what's really unique is you have a great experience in terms of e-commerce, right? Yep. How, how, how did that background really help in terms of, you know, doing bookkeeping and just taxes in general um, for, you know, Amazon sellers, like how does that different, uh, how's that different versus like a traditional, you know, brick and mortar business? Certainly. So the, the, the main thing to think about is when you are, you're trying to pick out a CPA or a bookkeeper for most businesses, they're very similar. They're very similar. E-commerce is a totally different ball game because now you introduce yep. lots of fees with Amazon and there, there's a lot of different things that, traditional CPAs and bookkeepers just don't understand with an e-commerce business. Now there's tons of people who are extremely smart and understand taxes, understand bookkeeping, but they still understand how e-commerce works or understands like even an, what an arbitrage business even is. Some people, some of them might even ask, is that legal to do? You know, <laughs> so, you know so it's, it's one of those cases where, uh, yeah. where, where you really have to make sure that the person you're, you're dealing with actually understands the industry because you might not get the right write-offs. You might not get, uh, the, the bookkeeping might not be accurate to begin with. And I've seen uh, many cases where the bookkeeping is just inaccurate because the person just doesn't understand how e-commerce bookkeeping is. And the biggest mistake I see a lot, and this is for legit, legitimate bookkeepers who theoretically know what they're doing, 
And yeah. I've also seen like, sellers do this too, is that when those deposits come in from Amazon, they just mark them off as sales. That's what they do. When in reality, mm. those, remember, keep in mind, those sales are after all the deductions that Amazon has for all their expenses. If you have a loan outstanding, it's part of that. Like all of that's kind of included with, with those deposits before you even get the money. So there, there's a lot of things you have to do to make sure the numbers are right by doing that. And what tends to happen is that at the end of the year, Amazon sends out their 1099, which shows all the amount of sales you have. And they look at their books and it's way off and they have no idea why. So then the, then the accountant says, well, I guess we just have to pay all these expenses. And so now, so now if you ever were to get audited, like they would say, well, why'd you write those off and expenses and be like, I don't know, my, my, my accountant did. <laughs> and then the accountant would be like, oh yeah, these numbers didn't match that. Yes. And then be like, okay, you need to provide us proof of all this stuff. And so now it's like causes this massive issue. So and I've seen this multiple times and there's, you know, plenty of books we've had to clean up because of stuff that other people did. So that's, that's really the key. The key thing is, is that a lot of people don't understand how they work. And so some of the questions you definitely should ask if you're going to, you know, ask, ask a bookkeeper or an accountant, uh, if they're, if they know e-commerce is just ask them and say, how many other e-commerce clients do you have? You know, tell me, tell me what happens when, when uh, a transaction comes up from Amazon, what, what, what is that? And if they, if they can't tell you the basic explanation I just gave you, they probably don't know what they're doing. Another one you could ask them and say, Tell me how, how, how does the online arbitrage business model work? If they can't answer that, they probably have no clue how your business operates. And then they might even ask you a silly question like, uh, oh, well, I see there's an expense here for a uh, Nike. Isn't that personal? <laughs> well, we know that people resell, you know, resell stuff from Nike, whereas they, they might not understand yeah. that. You know, an, another great question would be, uh, how, how do they handle gift cards? Like if I buy a gift card and I use that to get a discount for resale, how does that get accounted for? And if they have literally no clue what you're talking about, then that's another problem. You know, in realistically the way a gift card should work is generally you should have, uh, it should be an actual asset that's considered to your company until you use it. And then once it's actually used, then it's classified as an inventory asset at that point. And so that's, that's gen the general answer you should get based on someone who understands that. And then another one is asking about how you should treat cash back. Because cashback is a very legal gray area, and uh, it's a very very yeah. legal gray area. And you know, credit card rewards, hundred percent are that you don't have to you don't have to claim them. There's actually publications on the IRS's website that specifically tell you that you do not have to claim rewards. The cashback's a little different because you know there's no 1099s are generally issued from the company, so the IRS doesn't technically even know that they ever came in. However, you know. They do tell you in the IRS guidelines that any income that comes in is supposed to be taxable. That's the reason why they, they have a law in there that says if you steal stuff, you have to claim it. <laughs> you know? And so crazy. You know, if, if they say <laughs> that if you're embezzling that you're supposed to claim it, what makes you think that, that cash back you got isn't technically uh isn't technically taxable? Taxable. So, yeah. Yeah. That's that, why that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's Very an interesting great. subject is you know, you know, the more you sell on Amazon, the bigger you get that cash back and can add up, you know what I mean? Yep. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one there. And yep. all right, Chris, I got one more question. Again, appreciate your, you know, taking the time here. What, what would you say or tip in terms of, you know, Amazon sellers, when is tax season and what should they start doing in order to prepare and just to help out not themselves, but also, you know, the CPA that's going to be doing their taxes. Oh yeah, we're we're already in tax season. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. We're already there. We're already there. If you haven't started, you're too late now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're there. So uh and we've already seen many, many clients come into our tax offices and uh you know, we, we're getting ready to actually send out mm -hmm. our engagement letters for clients this week to get people prepared for that. So realistically what I would recommend being prepared right now is if you haven't especially for new people that haven't uh done any sort of bookkeeping or like that immediately start figuring out what your expenses are for the year. If you have not done inventory lab at all, if you have no, if you don't have inventory lab period, then you need to go back in time and download all of your bank statements and figure out what you bought and what you spent your money on. And realistically, even doing a spreadsheet, laying out all the stuff you did, is probably the best thing to do. And really, you know, even export CSV files from your bank statements and your credit card statements is probably the, the easiest way to do it. And literally go line by line and determine what it is, which this is a task that's going to suck. It's going to take time to do it, but it has to be done if you want to do your taxes. Now, if you've used Inventory Lab, 
Then the key thing is just to make sure all the expenses were actually listed on there as well, which you may have to do that exact same exercise. The difference is that instead of putting it in Excel, you're going to put it in Inventory Lab, which is a little bit easier to use. And like, again, if you're using the e-commerce, uh, if you're using someone who's uh, familiar with e-commerce, they should be able to log into Inventory Lab and understand what they're looking at there. And whereas we know that we can use Inventory Lab data and how, how to utilize that. So that's another question you can ask a person if they understand what even Inventory Lab is. And so that's kind of the, the main thing is to get all of your expenses, get everything in there and get into Inventory Lab. That's step number one. If you've actually done your bookkeeping properly, make sure it's fully up to date, make sure it's reconciled properly, uh, make sure whoever you're working with does have that prepared for your accountant. And as far as the deadlines coming up, if you're an S Corp, then your your deadline for that is March 15th this year. So it does have to be filed by March 15th. Uh, it, for everyone else, it's April 18th this year. And so keep in mind that, that those are the dates that need to be done. And generally your CPAs or your accountants need to have the information done well before that deadline date. Because you have to imagine that everyone, their brother is going to come in to get their taxes done. Yeah. If you come in, you know, if it's due March 15th for your, for your S Corp and you waltz in here on like March 8th, and you're like, hey, I need to get my S-Corp done. Uh, can you get this done in time? But pretty much any CPA or accountant will immediately tell you, no, we, we can't do it, even though the deadline mm -hmm. is a week away because we have all these other clients who are working on and we're trying to get these last minute things in. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're going to choose an accountant or CPA this year, you should start looking now to see if they have uh, capacity. I actually saw a tweet earlier today, actually it was yesterday I saw it, where someone actually posted saying that they sent out emails to 24 CPAs and 15 of them responded already and they all said they're at capacity. They can't handle any more people. So wow. you can start looking for CPAs right now. We personally can still take on clients. Mm -hmm. We have, we have a, a pretty big staff. We have about 70 people to work for us. So we have a, a lot of capacity to, to handle it. Now keep in mind that only a portion of those people can, can handle uh, can handle business taxes, especially if you're an S corp. I only have a certain subset of people that are very good S corps. Mm -hmm. So those are a little bit different, but if you're just starting out sole proprietor, I've got plenty of people that can handle those sorts of taxes and definitely start looking now, make sure you have that. If, for example, you can't get all of your stuff done on time, it's not like the worst thing in the world because you can file extensions. Extensions are free to file and it's okay to file them. You get an additional six months to file, to file your taxes. But one thing it doesn't do is it does not actually stop you having to pay taxes on the, the deadline. Yeah. So, so keep in mind, if you do file an extension because you're not ready, if you have a good CPA or accountant, they will tell you that you need to file in, you need to send in some sort of estimated amount at that point. So that way you don't end up being hit with penalties and interest. So generally what we do in those cases, we file the extension. We tell you how much you should send in for an estimation. You send that money in and then we finalize your tax return, whether that's June, July, August, whatever it is, then you basically get a refund for whatever you overpaid earlier in the year. So let's keep that in mind. It's not worst case scenario to do that. But the worst thing to do is, A, don't look for an accountant right now as you should be looking for one right now. Number two, wait till after the deadline because if you wait till after the deadline, now you have a late filing fee and you have a penalty and interest. Not a good thing. So start looking now. It's it's that time of year. Yeah, the earlier the better. And I remember, you know, I reached out to you guys like in November, right? Yep. And you gave, you gave some great tips in terms of just, you know, preparing for tax and after Q4. And I really like that advice because, you know, I didn't want to get surprised of how much I'm going to owe in taxes. And one of your advice then was like, coming off Q4, you're going to have a high, but don't forget to set aside a certain amount of what you're going to pay in taxes instead of just reinvesting it in the inventory, which is we all want, right? But yep. again, tax season is right around the corner. So it's important to kind of set aside that nest egg for tax season and that way you don't get uh, caught surprised. Yeah, yeah. The, the the line I always like to use is that Nike does not accept uh, Adidas sweaters or <laughs> Adidas sneakers. <laughs> they, yeah, you, know, you, you can't set them inventory. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can't. You can try, but you know. Yep, won't work. Uh, yeah. All righty, Chris. Um, thank you so much for taking the time here, and uh, I think you've helped a lot of you know new sellers, especially regarding you know sharing your value here of the finance and tax aspect. Uh, where can everyone find you if they want to reach out and maybe, you know, work with you in terms of their Amazon business? Absolutely. So you can go to talloakadvisors.com, which we have a, uh, we have all our information about what we, what we offer and that sort of thing on the website. Uh, schedule a strategy session on there. I typically chat with people for 45 minutes about their business, find out we can give you estimates, that sort of thing. 
And then, uh, you know, if you want to find out more about uh, the things I, I post as far as on tweets on Twitter, it's uh, Chris Potter 361. And that's that's where you can find me on Twitter, which is if you want to DM me, that's the best place to do it as well. Fantastic. All right, Chris. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yes, sir.